Good morning, everyone. Uh, we'll get started with our mentoring hour for today. A warm welcome to all of you who have joined in. Uh, so today we will be having Jean, who will be uh, speaking to us on interpersonal conflicts. And uh, after that, we can you know present our questions on this topic or any other topic that you have in mind. Uh, you know anything to do with ministry, anything to do with the classes that we have been covering. Uh, so uh, right now, over to Jean, who will. Uh, uh, give us a short talk on interpersonal conflicts. Thank you. Uh, Jean, Thank if you could please take over. Yes. Sure. Thank you. Um, Thank you, Deepika. It's a, it's a joy to be here. I, I apologize. There is something wrong with my system and my video is not playing. I think there's some technical glitch. I hope you all can hear me. Uh, I sincerely apologize that I'm not able to show my face because uh, there is an issue here. Um, Deepika, are you able to hear me? Very loud and clear, yes. Oh, yeah. Okay, great, great. Okay, so um, yeah, so warm welcome to all of you. Uh, we're going to just take a, a couple of minutes just to really look at um, interpersonal conflicts. And um, I, I'm sure you all would agree with me that it's something that happens very often. You know, we don't like to talk about it, and it's not almost uh, the most fun to deal with. But yes, it's a fact of life. So um, conflict is um, is important for the learning and our growth process. That is, if it is uh, resolved healthily. So it's something I guess you all would agree with me is that often we learn as children that everyone should get along. And uh, when conflict naturally arises, we think that there's something wrong with us, that we're not getting along with the other person. Another uh, important factor to keep in mind is we are never taught um, tools for really recognizing and managing conflict, let alone you know, how productively we may disagree or work our way through that conflict. Now, this is why it's so essential that we offer these tools to ourselves to help us really manage our interpersonal conflict. Okay, So to start with, I want to bring forth a question to you. Uh, how do you typically attempt to resolve interpersonal conflicts? Do you op openly communicate with the other person who you're having a conflict with? Um, do you seek mediation? I mean, someone has to come in between to mediate between you and the other person. Uh, are you very quick to apologize and forgive without really uh, discussing the matter, or uh, do you avoid conflict in all, uh, you know, its its uh, entirety, or are you very assertive that uh, you know you ensure that you get your way done? Um, and what I'd want to just present to you is uh, something a little researched and something that is used very commonly uh, in organizations and uh, and you know in in centers where there are understanding of conflict. So it's a pair of researchers by name Thomas and Kilman in 1974. They studied uh, workers and their routine conflicts in the workplace. Now, over time, they were able to observe a pattern of ways in which people generally resolved conflicts. And uh, most methods can be brought down to these five core methods. These five options uh, actually forms the basis of the Thomas Kilman conflict resolution model. Now, these five conflict resolution styles um, are described by the uh, by the by the this instrument uh, as positioned along a spectrum. There are two spectrums over here. You would notice there is uh, assertiveness on the x-axis, that is uh, on the vertical one, and uh, um, cooperativeness on the horizontal one. So just quickly to just share with you, cooperativeness refers to the extent to which, uh, as a person, you may try to understand and satisfy the other person's concerns. OK, so it's a uh, it's your willingness to cooperate with others, consider their needs and work towards mutually beneficial solutions when you're in a conflict situation. Now, it ranges from being uncooperative to being cooperative. The assertiveness aspect of it is um, uh, refers to the extent to which you seek to satisfy your own concerns. That is um, where you're willing to assert your own needs, desires, 
uh, or viewpoints in a certain situation. And it ranges from low, uh, from being unassertive to being highly assertive. <clears throat> okay, so when if you were to look at this classification, there are five. There's competing, there's collaborating, compromising, avoiding, and accommodating. So I'll quickly just go through this, and uh, I'm going to help you with a uh, um, uh, an instrument that you can try for yourself to really see what kind of style you are in. So just to quickly explain this, the competing style is characterized by a person who pursues their own concerns at the expense of others. Uh, and often it involves a win-lose mentality. So when the person tries to win and get his or her way, uh, uh, they get their way, even if it means the other person loses. It's like saying, you know, I'm right and you're wrong. That's what competing means. The next one is collaborating. Here, the people seek to find solutions that satisfy both their own needs as well as the needs of the others. So this aims for a win-win outcome. Here, you're working together with the other person to find a solution that works best for you as well as for the other. It's saying, uh, it's like saying, come, let's figure this out together. OK, the third one is the compromising one. This is where individuals um, you know, who use this style are willing to make concessions and seek um, solutions that are midway, or what we call is a middle ground. This is when both of you give up a little here and there to meet in the middle. Okay, It's like, you know, uh, let's, let's attempt to do this. Um, I, I give up some, you give up some. That's what it, it means. The next one is avoiding. Uh, sometimes people just avoid the conflict or pretend it's not there. It's like saying, you know, I don't want to talk about it for now. This avoiding mode is characterized by people who sidestep uh, conflicts and ignore or minimize whatever the issues may be. And the last one is the accommodating one. This is uh, where you tend to give in to concern and wishes of others. So you let the other person get what they want and you might give up your own needs. It's like saying, OK, I'll go along with your idea. Now, this uh, model can actually help individuals or even couples really recognize their conflict resolution patterns and work towards better uh, harmonious interactions. So what research suggests is that um, conflict resolution style has a big impact on the strength and the uh, longevity of a relationship and that and that the kind of conflicts or the frequency of conflicts doesn't matter as much in other words it says how you fight matters more than how often you fight or what you really fight about okay so what do we do with this information so next time you're finding yourself in a situation where you recognize that you're avoiding or you're accommodating you're competing you're compromising or collaborating, you take a moment to pause and think about whether that's the mode that you want to use. If you really find yourself defaulting to a certain mode that isn't serving you well, uh, it's important to actively choose uh, another mode. Um, I'm just going to put, um, uh, OK, I'm not able to type anything either. Um, all right, I'm sorry. I'm not able to type anything uh, either, but there is uh, what what I probably do is I'll I'll share it with uh, Pastor Nancy and maybe it can it can go out uh, alongside with the with the recording. Uh, there is a link <clears throat> where there is an adapted version of this instrument. It's not uh, the 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 standardized version because that's uh, that's something that needs to be paid for but then it's an adapted version it's a free version that i will let pastor nancy know which can be sent for and uh, or uh, pastor nancy can i just uh, send it to you on your whatsapp and if you could just put that up on yes. the yeah yes, i just please. send it to you yeah, yeah. thank you so um, you know you you can you can just go through this. I mean, it's it's a set of thirty five questions, and it will kind of help you see what mode you generally use. Okay, um, uh, to to just understand, and I think it's important for us, even as we figure out, uh, you know, what kind of conflict styles we may have. Just a quick 
um, a, a highlight of certain uh, biblical principles to resolve conflict. So the first and foremost thing is to be able to listen. Um, and as it's written in James 1 19, everybody, sh everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to become angry. So it's important not to interrupt each other when you're talking, especially in a conflict. In addition, let the other person finish speaking and begin your response by first recapping what they said uh, so that you can confirm what you understood and then talk. Okay, so it's a, this is a principle we we don't use very well. I mean, we're we're quick to really respond without listening and without sharing back or giving a feedback about what we have heard. The second one is to hold back judgment. Matthew seven one says, "Judge not." So it is when you are dealing with a conflict, treat it like a brainstorming session and not an argument. You know, each of you throw out your solutions after you've really spoken about your feelings. Um, and, uh, and instead of judging the solution, focus on addressing the element of the plan um, that doesn't work and suggest alternatives. So come to a place where you're collaborating to really brainstorm an issue. The third one is be direct in addressing conflicts. Matthew 18, 15 says, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. But that's the first step. And then, yes, there are other steps. If you look in 16 and 17, verse 16, 17, 16 says, take someone else with you. 17 says, involve the church, right? So uh, do that. Be direct in addressing conflicts rather than gossiping or rather than talking about uh, the issue to others, addressing it helps. Fourth one is to seek reconciliation. Matthew 5, 23, 24 says, if you bring your gift to the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, first be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. So even when you're reconciling, remember that even when the Bible encourages reconcile, reconciliation, it may not always guarantee that the other person will be willing to reconcile. In such cases, find peace in knowing that you have followed these principles in the best of your ability and you can trust in God to work in the heart of all those parties involved and fifth the most important thing is to be able to forgive Matthew 6 14 and 15 for if you forgive men their trespasses your heavenly father will also forgive you if you do not forgive men their trespasses neither will your father forgive your trespasses forgiveness is one of the crucial things in every relationship because it builds back restores and helps to go forward um yeah this is a really brief short one i hope this was helpful uh thank you deepika i'll be open for any questions if they may have any thank you thank you so much for that talk uh yes uh, if anyone has any questions on this particular topic of interpersonal conflict uh please go ahead with your questions and then later, maybe we can address other questions that you may have uh, to the faculty who are here. Please go ahead. It's an excellent topic, and we all deal with uh, you know interpersonal conflicts almost on a weekly basis. So, any questions that you would like to ask regarding this, please go ahead. Um, if you find it difficult to unmute, uh, you can always just type your question in the chat, and we will address it. Hi, Pastor Deepika. Uh, could I ask a question? Please go ahead. Yes. Um, uh, thank you. Um, thank you, Pastors, for doing this. Uh, this is a very interesting topic. Um, Pastor Jean uh, or, or anyone, I wanted to kind of check um, or just uh, if you could talk a little bit about the role of emotions um, in conflict management, uh, especially I think both in terms of, um, say, you know, um, um, as a as someone trying to resolve a conflict between two people. Uh, I often find myself in that situation where, uh, you know, two people have had a conflict and I'm trying to uh, kind of get them to reconcile. Um, 
often uh, in that process there's like emotions are very high and you know there's hurt and anger so just um, kind of navigating around that is um, quite challenging so any any thoughts on uh, managing emotions navigating through difficult emotions uh, in the process of conflict resolution Right. Thank, Thank you, you, Sam. That's, a, that's an excellent question. And, uh, you know, you can never separate uh, emotions from conflict. Um, nevertheless, we understand. And, and that, that topic in itself, uh, managing, regulating emotions in conflict, is in itself a huge and a big topic. But I'll probably just address a couple of points. The first one is, uh, um, depending on the situation, depending on the people involved in the conflict, it mat the emotions, um, you know, uh, arise. Like, for example, if you are having a conflict with an auto driver, your emotions aren't. I mean, they're they're kind of brief. You, if if you if you are able to control and regulate yourself, you can actually just avoid a conflict and you know leave that, and you can figure out uh, how you regulate your emotions. But let's say if it is uh, between a friend, or if it's a spouse, or if it's if it's children, that's when. Uh, emotions tend to take over. So, um, so something that in conflict management, the first and foremost thing that you know, as a precursor to all of this, is to be able to share emotions first and foremost. So, when you are resolving a conflict, like I said, you can't separate it. So, you may need to get to a place of sharing emotions, being willing to acknowledge, not dismiss hear those emotions out however hard it may it may be and the uh, the the issue sometimes is that um you know people don't understand or they're not in a position to really um uh, work alongside with their emotions so you know giving good time to just relate emotions before coming to this step process of of problem solving, of you know, strategizing or finding uh, or brainstorming, all of that. Before that, it is to come to a place of saying, okay, let's just be able to talk our emotions out. So that in itself is, I say, is a training. You know, to to be able to one address your emotions, to be able to um, have the other person. Uh, acknowledge it. That is a it's a huge training. We we're never taught to acknowledge people's emotions. We especially, I think, in our culture, we are taught to dismiss it and say, "Don't cry." You know, why are you feeling angry? Um, uh, it's okay. You know, you don't have to feel so bad about it. All of this is dismissing. But to come within conflicts to say, you know, I acknowledge that whatever you're feeling is what you're feeling, and I want to hear what you're feeling. I think that maybe is the first step that we can do it, that it's OK to express our emotions, but it needs to be constructive. It can't be in a way that uh, hurts the other person by maybe your language you use or the, or the abuse that may come about. That's something that may need to get protected. But to let people know in conflicts, it's OK to share these emotions. And once the emotions die down, you know, we get into the rational part of it. We use the rational part of our brain to discuss these conflicts. I know it isn't a step-by-step -step process, Sam, but uh, this is at large maybe one thing that we could do. I'll also leave it open for the other pastors to answer. Thank you so much, Jean. Uh, anyone else wants to add uh, to what Jean has already shared? Please go ahead. Uh, Sam, was that helpful, or do you have any other follow-up questions? Um, no, that was that was extremely helpful. It's it's also got me into thinking that you know the resolution uh, may not be uh, the solution. Like you know, probably we have a disagreement about a task or a process or anything. Um, but uh, what Pastor Jean shared is getting me into thinking like uh, just people being able to just express their emotions, not even agree, but just express their emotions, could be a form of resolution itself. Um, so I think uh, so that uh, that that's a good clarity that I have. Uh, thank you, thank you, Pastor Jean. Uh, thank you. Um, yeah. So we have a question posted here uh, by Prince. Uh, when reconciling and trying to solve the conflict with a brother, friends are someone in the circle, and if it is only getting heated up, like if another person is not understanding, 
defending and provoking, and it's only getting more complicated, what would we have to do? How can we deal in those situations? And what are the steps we can take to avoid this kind of result when trying to resolve conflicts? So if one person um, involved in the conflict is provoking and uh, causing the situation to become more intense, uh, how can we intervene and how can we help? Uh, uh, Jean, could you please help us with this question? Sure. Thank you, Deepika. Um, uh, Prince, I think I understood your question as if there are other friends also involved, are bought into this uh, conflict resolution and how it gets uh, uh, heated up. I think that's what uh, you meant. And I'm, I'm going back to the point that I bought about in Matthew 1815, which I said, be direct in addressing conflicts. So especially if you do have a conflict with someone, um, it is important to deal with it uh, with it with them directly first rather than getting people in um, you know and, and i've seen this happen so often especially in couples who are having issues um, the larger family is bought in and then there is sides being taken there is um, you know there's there's a lot more of mess that takes place because there are other people's opinions in it and also uh, you know, like, for example, if it's a husband, his parents come in and they are um, more looking at it from the husband's side rather than at their daughter-in-law's side, right? So, uh, sorry, the son's side rather than at their daughter-in-law's side. So as a principle, it is it is wonderful. It is great if we can follow that process as it is written in the Bible. Be direct in addressing the problem. If you find that it isn't helping, I would say seek help from a third person, maybe a pastor, a counselor, someone who is not emotionally involved with you, and uh, and then try and resolve conflicts. It's when you involve a friend or a family, they are as emotionally charged in the in this connection as you are. So um, so as a process, be direct, uh, and and if you've already involved other people in, maybe it's a good thing to tell them to keep away till you know, you and the person, the, your partner or the person in, in question here are able to resolve that situation. Yeah, I think that throws a lot of clarity on uh, the question being asked. Uh, Prince, you did mention here in the chat uh, that you are thinking more about conflicts where two persons are just involved personally. Um, yeah, I think that was partially addressed in the first question which was posed. Um, Anything else that Gene you would like to add uh, in the light of what he has uh, shared further here that he's thinking sure. about a question specifically in terms of two people being involved personally? Okay, so if that is so, if you find that you're not able to really, um, you know, discuss the conflict with someone, then it's okay to bring in someone. Again, the, the choice of person really matters. You know, if it is like we said, if it's a friend or a family who may be as emotionally involved in this, you probably have someone who's taking your side, which means you're really not looking at um, at resolving a conflict, you're really looking at someone to take your side. And so there is two against one. Now, that's not the point. The point of a conflict is to come uh, in, in terms to understand how two of you can work together. So that's why when you use, when you choose a third person, be judicious in, in the person you, you choose. Someone who is an, maybe an outsider, who's a third person, who's probably, um, you know, wiser, who's, uh, who's in the world, who can help objectively help the two of you through that situation. Thank you. Um, is that helpful, Prince? Or uh, do you have any other follow-up questions? If you have anything further to ask regarding this, oh, OK, perfect. Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much. Um, yes, we have another question. Uh, which has been posted by Metro Stars. Uh, this question is about interpersonal conflict uh, based on uh, religious backgrounds. So if there are two persons involved in a conflict and they are from different religious backgrounds and there's a um, religious issue at stake, uh, 
the example that he has mentioned here is uh, someone getting offended because someone else has spat carelessly while during their fasting. Uh, how would we deal with that kind of a sensitive issue? Uh, Jean, if you could please address this question. OK, I'll do my best. Um, I think it's important. Now, uh, your question specifically says a Christian versus a Muslim or a Hindu. Uh, now, I, uh, you know, being a Christian doesn't need to change if you are having a conflict with a Christian or whether with, with someone with a different faith. We are still called to um, uh, differentiate uh, to to be able to resolve our conflicts in the same way, whether they are people uh, of our faith, people of a different faith. So I think I'd throw that question back is how would you deal with it with, with someone who's a believer, right? Maybe they have, they've come from an understanding of some, maybe some superstition or something, right? So the first thing that you would do is to maybe listen to them, right? To understand where they're coming from, not dismissing, not defending but really listening to them and come to a place of apologizing for maybe hurting them as people, right? And you could bring in your intentions that you didn't mean to hurt them um, for, for them as people. Um, uh, and that, you know, maybe the respect that you showed was something that you would like to correct. So if there are, to, to be in humility, even when we are addressing things, um, you know, that, that may not make too much of sense for us, like for ex the example that you've put, is is to um, you know be humble and say, uh, ask for forgiveness for something that you carelessly did without actually putting uh, putting too much of thought with it, and maybe also sharing at that point of time that um, you know maybe in your faith or in your understanding, uh, in, this is not looked at, and that's why you would have done something like that. So, I wouldn't see it very different from dealing with again another believer or or someone who is a christian whether they're muslim or hindu the same thing applies um however you deal with them yeah and uh, deepika i'll open it back to the others if they'd like to add in yes please if anyone else would like to address this uh, question from the faculty uh, please go ahead kennedy uh, has that been helpful or do you have any follow-up questions? All right. Uh, I think um, that was uh, helpful. Thank you. Uh, anyone else would like to ask questions regarding uh, interpersonal conflict specifically? Uh, if not, then maybe we could have uh, you know other questions being brought in. Uh, but. Uh, anyone else would like to address this particular issue? And just a quick question to Jean. Um, so, um, like Jean, in interpersonal conflicts, just wanted to understand based on the intensity of the conflicts, like, um, like, could it be that that the see obviously the objective of the um, whole exercise of you know sharing of emotions and etc being truthful and direct and all is to solve the issue but could it be that uh, it could be in different phases right uh, at the first sitting it could be just to bring an understanding but nothing is resolved um to bring an understanding um that hey uh, to both the parties that there's something that needs to be resolved yeah. um, you know could it be in phases and if so um you know based on the intensity of the conflict could you just uh, explain to us that okay this could be a phase this could be a phase so we understand that okay this is a win you know we've gone in for this this is the objective we got that mm. now we move on to the next thing so yeah thank you yeah thank you pastor jacob yeah, um, so um, resolving conflicts definitely is a process it's not uh, a, 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 a you know exactly like what you said pastor jayakumar depending on the intensity and if the intensity is greater the time taken the the steps taken to it are are very varied um so the first and foremost thing and and and, and i just and i think the what we do even in counseling is first and foremost when we meet two people together who have intense conflicts 
we kind of draw about a certain objective or certain goals. What are we looking at, at doing? So they may say, yeah, we've come to resolve this conflict. Now, that's a really, really broad goal. And we break it down and say, OK, let's if we were to do it stepwise, how were we how would we like to do it? So one person may say, I really want to bring about my hurt and my anger. I want the other person to listen to it. Right. So maybe it's it's then just it's a it's a, a initial phase of just sharing emotions and that in itself extremely intense. If, if it is an extremely intense one, it can go on for a period of time. Then you you draw the second one. OK, once we've done that, we're going to look at um, uh, maybe, you know, resolving, breaking down the conflict into smaller parts. Now, let, let's suppose there is a husband and wife conflict over here. Now, there may be very, very many inroads to a certain conflict. So we tease that conflict out and say, OK, there are 10 issues general issues that we have over here, what seems the uh, smallest or the easiest one that we could probably talk about. And then we start there. Then we move into something what we call as fair fighting rules, which is, you know, we, we have a certain guideline as to how you're going to resolve a conflict, whether you're in a session or whether you're at home, what are certain rules that you will keep in mind as you are going to be, as you're going to resolve a conflict, as you're going to talk about the conflict. Then comes the stage of actually discussing or brainstorming whatever each of those probably 10 areas they spoke about. How do you um, break it down? What kind of alternatives that you can bring in? Then as they're doing that, you're looking at the method. How are they doing it? What is their communication like within that step of um, uh, dealing with the conflict and how they can they can change that? And then uh, so, so you're using this entire process here and there. You know, you, you, you it, like I said, it, it may not be just watertight compartments, but nevertheless, you're learning and picking up a lot more on how to resolve conflicts by the time you come to a place of, of a, of an outcome or of a decision. So, in broad, these are maybe certain steps that we'd look at. I hope that was helpful, Pastor Jacob. Pastor Jakes, uh, do you have any follow-up questions? OK, yeah, uh, you have posted here that this is good. Yes, thank you. Um, any other questions that anyone would like to raise regarding this particular topic? Or if you have any other questions, I mean, um, if no one has any questions on this particular topic, maybe we could take up other questions as well. Um, just one more question. Uh... Please go ahead, Pastor. Um, yeah. Yeah. So this uh, this question is again uh, again on the issue of resolving conflicts. So um, my question is like, if one person is unwilling, totally unwilling to to even come to the negotiating stage, you know, or to even come to the uh, result, totally, you know, uh, for whatever reason. So how do we go about it? You know, is there a method to it? Um, yes, of course, we need to pray, and then God will work on their hearts. Um, but the reasoning, you know, let's say the reasoning is not happening, it's not bearing fruit. Like how, how long do we let it go? Um, is there, is there anything, any strategy, you know, any method, um, if the one party is unwilling to even mm. sit down, talk, and for whatever reason, yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, so in conflicts, that becomes an issue. Conflict resolution that becomes an issue when the other person. Uh, in the conflict is not willing to reconcile. Um, so some of the things that, um, again, I'm just telling you uh, probably as part of the experience that we've had is, uh, let's say, in a marriage, there's one person who's coming in, the other person, other, other spouse is not willing. So one thing that we do work with this, the particular person who's entered into our session, we've, we ask them to um, uh, um, you know, come to a place of, I mean, they, they need to temper down themselves before they make approaches to the, to the, to the spouse. So you make different approaches, either um, one is directly, then you use other resources, other people resources, it could be family, it could be friends, it could be if they're believers, it's the church. Um, uh, and then you know, even if none uh, none of that works, the next thing we suggest is time. Give them time. 
And all of this is very individual based, right? Uh, there isn't, you know, you should give five months or six months. It's not that you're, you're actually working alongside with the willing partner to figure out how this is. But then these are some of the things that we would do. So we, we give them time because sometimes after a certain point of time, uh, the other person may come and be willing to come in for help. The last thing that, that I personally do is um, as a counselor, I reach out and uh, you know say that uh, your spouse has uh, approached me for this. Would you be willing to talk about? Sometimes they do come in, they do talk, um, and within individually with me, where I'm able to just listen to them, help them through. And um, there are times we coax, I coax them into having a joint session, not for an outcome but just being able to talk for a couple of a couple of sessions. So if I, I would definitely look at it with this kind of a progression. Now, if that also doesn't work, uh, it comes back to the pastor. We say the pastor takes on and, uh, you know, helps because uh, the word of the pastor is, I've seen personally in my experience, the word of the pastor is always seen much, much more honorable. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jean. Uh, yeah, um, Pastor Jakes uh, is, has said thank you. He's happy with the answer. Uh, we have one question posted here, so we will address that. And then, Sam, you know, we can come to you. Uh, so the question here is from Kennedy. And uh, he is asking, at what point in, in, in an interpersonal conflict would we bring in the uh, element of punishment? So I'm assuming this question has uh, more to do with conflict between a superior and an employee. Uh, maybe in an office setup. Uh, so, uh, uh, Jean, if you could uh, address this question uh, of conflict between uh, someone in a superior position and an employee who's working below them, and the conflict that has occurred between these two parties. Um, so, punishment in general, um, I don't think has a place in interpersonal conflicts, but then if it is with the same uh, example that uh, Deepika has brought about, uh, I'd, I'd call them consequences because uh, let's say there are there are certain guidelines that maybe in an office setup you are to uh, maintain, which is not maintained, and as a result, there are consequences to it. Um, I, maybe the word punishment is probably, which we could probably replace it by maybe something like consequence. And yes, it does definitely have an element where um, even after uh, a resolution, you probably do find that there, there, is, uh, um, there is an of, uh, offense that keeps happening over and over again. Then yes, there is a consequence that, that may result. For example, uh, maybe I, I look at it in a personal setting. Um, let's say between two people, there is um, there is violence that's happening. Okay, there is a physical abuse. No, although you know physical ab abuse cannot be condoned. Let's say the person apologizes, comes back, but it happens repeatedly, and then there needs to come a point where there is a consequence. Maybe there needs to be a partial separation so that you know this doesn't repeat itself. So I would replace the word consequences for that. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so, Kennedy, is uh, is that helpful, or uh, would you like to ask anything further regarding this particular question? Otherwise, you know, uh, we can uh, move to the next question. Um, so, Kennedy wants specifically to know at what point would we consider this further step of um, Bringing in those consequences. consequences. The concept. Okay, so um, I, always at the first hand, you definitely attempt to reconcile. Right? Uh, again, it depends on the gravity of the situation. Like I said, if it's something like violence, and if it is the uh, uh, you know you you're putting someone in danger, then it should almost be immediate. Let's suppose it's something like. Um, um, I mean, I can't say they're different gravity, but let's let's look at emotional uh, abuse. Let's say if there is there is a lot of insulting, a lot of words that that keep coming in. Uh, there needs to be maybe a correction once, probably uh, knowing that the person is doing something about it. The evidence 
that the other person is working towards um, minimizing these these abusive reactions. If you're seeing that, yes, you may give maybe probably, let's say, another chance. Um, Kennedy, I may not be able to say at what point and say, you know, at this second point, you should do a third point. It's difficult. It's, it depends on the individual. Every individual, every situation is different. But you would you would need to call out something if it isn't being changed, rather than allowing it to keep brewing over and over. But yeah, I think I've given you some examples of certain guidelines. Thank you, Jean. Uh, so yeah, Kennedy uh, is happy with that. Uh, so um, we can move into Sam's question. Sam, please unmute and go ahead. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Dubika. Um, so Pastor Jean, the, the graph that you shared on assertiveness versus cooperativeness, I, I love that uh, it brings in so much of structure and clarity. Uh, and, you know, so I, as, as I see uh, progression, I, you know, it's like, so maybe at the bottom, we start with unassertive and uncooperative where, you know, I think the, the whole thing is just avoiding the whole thing to moving towards compromise. And then finally, I think uh, moving towards collaboration. So from a place of avoiding completely to compromising to collaborating, uh, I think that's the progression. I, I love that. And I'm, I'm just thinking uh, in terms of, so, but eventually if like, you know, one goal of uh, getting two people to resolve conflict is, uh, you know, getting them from not talking to each other to kind of collaborating. Uh, but oftentimes, uh, you know, it's just we are happy to settle in the middle ground, which is compromising, you know, like, okay, um, you know, say sorry, shake hands, uh, fine, what happened, happened. And, and people tend to like, okay, the, you know, uh, we were avoiding, but now at least we are talking, we are smiling at each other, and, and people are just happy to stay there. Uh, and that itself is not a full resolution, but anything around moving from a place of just compromising, which I don't, I mean, I see it as progressive, progress but not you know like not the complete thing so to move from uh, a, a mediocre compromise to actually a genuine collaboration um, any anything on those lines Thanks. so i i think uh, maybe something that i missed saying is that yes like you said sam a collaborative negotiation style is usually the most effective style for managing conflict and having those long-term relationships however these different conflict management styles can be effectively applied to different phases and types of conflict. So though we may have a predisposition towards a particular conflict style, we sometimes adopt different styles depending on the situation. Like, for example, uh, competing is useful when you need to assert your rights or protect your boundaries, especially in situations where others might try to take advantage of you. Sometimes accommodating may be the best immediate choice when your, let's suppose, your boss is unhappy about a task that went all difficult. Avoiding can be wise when someone seems volatile or when we don't expect to deal with them again. Uh, compromising may be a fine way to resolving a minor issue uh, fast. So uh, when you look at it, we may use a lot of these styles, but it's not that every point of time we may need to be collaborative. Nevertheless, when when to move from compromising to collaborate uh, collaborating uh, remember collaboration requires two people right you if you want to be a collaborator you need someone who is going to be just as much as a collaborator with you and that definitely requires uh, uh, patience it definitely requires openness it requires humility it requires uh, you to be persuasive with them you know, because the person you may be dealing with may be a compromiser, right? And so they may quickly compromise, but then you, you're the one who may, who may need to bring them up to that speed of collaborating, of showing that openness and showing that willingness, um, uh, you know, being really patient and enduring to go through that. So it's a two-way process and, and it's for you to be able to train the other person as well into becoming a collaborator with some of these things that I had mentioned. I hope that was helpful, Sam. Yes, yes, Masha. Thank you so much. Thank you for adding uh, that extra layer of uh, clarity. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jean. Uh, we have one more question here. This is from Deeksha, uh, who says that sometimes in a conflict situation, even though it's not really you know uh, that person's nature generally, but due to new things which have come along, 
which have hurt a lot, uh, uh, this person would be probably reacting. And so she says over here, sometimes new things hurt us a lot and we try a lot to come out of them uh, because we know it's not good for us. Uh, but you know, the person is unable to come out of the hurt uh, which has been inflicted. So in a conflict situation like that, what can that person do to come out of that? Uh, if you could help us with this question, please. Yeah, uh, thanks, Diksha, for the question. So yeah, I think what you mean to say is when there are, um, when already things have happened to us, when we've gone through some trauma, some difficulty, there are new things that uh, add and pile on to us. Uh, we understand that it's not good, but we're not able to get out of it. OK, so um, this probably, um, uh, it, it, it may be a sub point of interpersonal conflicts, but this is something that we may need to individually heal and deal with. So there can be uh, trauma can definitely cause deep seated pain, deep seated heat, uh, uh, hurt, sorry, deep seated hurt and uh, a lot of um, uh, uh, core beliefs about us, others and uh, the future right the trauma does that it affects us it affects the way we see ourselves the way we see others and the way we see our future now and and so anyone who comes in and maybe talks to us or says something to trigger us it brings about the same situations of hurt the important thing over here is to find healing for ourselves to come to that place of inner wholeness to come to that place of really um spelling out what are some of those wrong thoughts and beliefs that we have kept with us that continues to stick in our lives and that becomes like a pattern for our behavior so we may need to go back and really declutter that and i would suggest you know do it with the help of someone who can help you explore your innermost thoughts which your traumatic innermost thoughts that really cause you this sense of hurt and heal from that because until we are healed from within um, we may not be able to deal with people right people will not change those who say things to you or you know may, may not even have even a smallest idea that they're hurting you right so you may not be able to change others but you can work and with the power of the Holy Spirit really renew your own mind, come to a place of um, uh, healing your mind with the word, coming back to taking back the promises of God so that you know you are healed. And so when you deal with others, you're able to see the situation or people more objectively. Uh, thank you. So uh, Diksha, is that helpful? Uh, is there anything else? OK, all right, yeah. yeah. Um, so uh, anyone else has any questions on this particular topic or anything else? We can take one more question before we conclude. So if anyone has any questions, uh, you can raise a hand or you can post your question in the chat. All right, if there are no questions, um, we could maybe close with a word of prayer. Um, yeah, I think there are no other questions. Uh, if any one of the students could please, uh, you know, uh, pray even as we conclude this session, and after that we can all disperse. Could we have any one student pray? Uh, you know, and then we can conclude. All right, uh, yeah, let's pray. Uh, we thank you, Lord, for today's session. Thank you, Lord, for uh, for Jean, for the uh, information that she gave and all the advice that she was able to provide. Uh, Lord, we pray that you would help us in all our interpersonal relations so that uh, we deal with them wisely. We deal with them with uh, your help. And we pray, oh Lord, that today, even as we go through our classes, you would be with us and uh, bless us in all that we do thank you lord in jesus name amen
thank you so much uh, everyone for joining in today and uh, yeah we'll again meet next thursday for our next mentoring session jean thank you so much uh, for this uh, session it's been most helpful uh, and yeah um, so uh, now we can thank you so yeah we can now disperse for our classes thank you <laughs>